two nerdy Stanford PhDs walk into your office. They've been researching a new algorithm to index web pages called PageRank from their dorm room. It's been a huge success. So much so they've crashed Stanford servers, and in the process, they've been kicked off the network. They need money fast to get back online. If you can tell, this is the story of Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google. At this point in history, they're the 18th search engine. They have no business model and no team, but they do have an incredibly ambitious vision for their technology. Imagine you're the venture capitalist listening to them. You ask Larry and Sergey how big Google will be, and they respond, 10 billion. You think they mean market cap, but they correct you and say they will make 10 billion a year in revenue. After that meeting, you invest the biggest check in your venture fund's history. This may all sound like a movie, but this is actually a real moment in the life of a VC at Kleiner Perkins. And it could mean the difference between being out of the job or making billions and being part of an iconic company defining the modern internet. It's not always this glamorous, but I do think being a VC is an incredible job. You're literally spending your time looking for the next Google, and in the process, you're getting paid to meet and learn from incredible entrepreneurs who are building the future today. But becoming a venture capitalist is maybe the most difficult career path I know. It's up there, along with being a professional athlete in a major sport. And I don't mean to say that I'm personally as incredible as LeBron James or Serena Williams, who actually is a VC now. I just mean it from a pure number standpoint. When I was first trying to get a VC job, there were probably only a couple people being hired into the entire industry every year. And even though it's become trendy to the point that now tens of thousands of people call themselves VCs on LinkedIn. We're brothers from New Hampshire. We're venture capitalists. The harsh reality is there's probably only about 100 to 200 VCs in the world who work at one of these major funds and have returned any serious money to their investors. That's about the number of starters in the NBA or about a fourth the size of the number of major leaguers in the MLB. So it really is as small and opaque as an industry as you can find. But breaking into this industry can be done. And my mission is to demystify this for outsiders. In this video, I'm going to give you the inside scoop on how I broke into venture capital at the famed Kleiner Perkins, which invested in companies like Google, Amazon, and Twitter, and how I became a general partner at SignalFire, one of the fastest growing Silicon Valley funds in history. So just like a professional athlete, the way to become a VC is to train yourself like a VC. There's nothing stopping you from getting on the court and putting in the hard yards. And for venture, that means you're going to have to figure out how to do three things. Find amazing deals, be able to recognize which ones are great, and have the magnetism to win an allocation into those deals. Doing that usually means you have to figure out how you can add value to the founders. And you're going to have to develop your own strategy for doing that, which is unique to you. First off though, you have to be an information hog. Many VCs I know read three to four hours each day. I personally make it a habit to read term sheet every day and research every company that's getting funding. This is my personal way of staying on top of what's going on in the industry, but it's also a way to get some feedback. It takes companies 10 to 15 years to IPO, and you may only make one, two investments per year. So you have to find some way to short circuit that feedback cycle to learn faster. And keeping track of companies you like and seeing which ones raise is also a rough way to do that. There's also just a plethora of Twitter, email newsletters, and blogs that you can read. And I'm happy to share a few of my favorites if you ask in the comments. But consuming tons of information is just table stakes. Ultimately, you're gonna to have to develop a unique X factor that sets you apart. One of the best ways to stack the deck in your favor is to specialize. The venture world has grown 10 times bigger and increasingly competitive in the past decade. So it's getting harder and harder as a generalist to compete with everybody else that's out there. So a lot of people end up picking a specialty. One common way to think of this is to pick a major and a minor. A major being a sector focus like crypto or the creator economy or AI, and a minor being a stage focus, like seed stage or growth stage. There is risk in being too narrow in your focus. For example, if you pick quantum computing, right, it's possible there may not be any companies that get that big in the next five years or so. But if you get too broad, like enterprise software, it may mean that it's going to be hard to stick out. So once you've picked a focus area, now you have to figure out how do you create deal flow, build pattern recognition, and add value to founders and investors. And there's no one right answer here. There are different styles for different investors. The only thing that matters is that you become the best at whatever strategy that you develop. Some people are massive Twitter influencers who've built distribution to founders like Harry Stebbings, who runs the 20 Minute VC podcast. He interviews the best VCs around the world, 
which has helped him build his own pattern recognition for deals. And he's also building a network of sales operators who can help add value to companies as a way to win deals. So he's got this integrated end-to-end -end strategy that plays to his strengths. At Signalfire, we've built the entire company as a tech startup with world-class ex-Google and Stanford PhD engineers who've developed tools like SaaS recruiting workflow to help support founders and win deals and massive data systems internally to help us source deals. And there are some other people who just become the world's best expert in some very narrow domain and build their whole network there. Whatever the approach, you need a coherent strategy that aligns to your strengths. Think of low cost experiments that leverage your strengths that you can test and learn from quickly. One of the unique parts of my background is I was a public school administrator a long time ago. Turns out Bessemer was one of the first VC funds that got into ed tech investing. So I noticed they had done higher ed investing, but nothing in K through 12. So I volunteered my expertise to map out that space for them for free. I played that student card as an excuse to ask a bunch of ed tech founders if they'd be willing to chat with me as part of a school project. I also had a research background from McKinsey working as part of their internal think tank arm. One of the projects I worked on happened to be a study of the future of energy demand. And as it turns out, Clyder Perkins was investing a lot into clean tech at the time. As part of their investment thesis, they would have to have a macro component. For example, how would energy demand for oil move against natural gas if you happen to be investing in natural gas vehicles? And this background also helped me get a job at Signalfire. McKinsey's think tank arm approach was to pair anonymized data across their client base with the expertise of all their firm sector leads. Signalfire also had a proprietary database of consumer spend, talent movements and financial flows, and a network of firm advisors across every major vertical. So I could basically replicate the techniques I learned at McKinsey to build market map investment theses at Signalfire. It may very well take you years to build up your own skill set first before you have something unique to offer. And this is why so many successful VCs first start working for fast growing startups to build skills that are helpful for founders. But it is possible to become a VC without deep operating experience. Some of the world's most successful VCs from Peter Fenton to Mike Moritz are career investors without any meaningful operating experience whatsoever. If you ask my opinion, I think if you know for a fact you want to be a VC and you have the ability to get into venture, just do it right away. This is a big point of contention, but I personally think you should just start working on what you want to do right away. And I think a very common pathway is for junior VCs to use the information edge they get seeing so many companies to then join a hot portfolio company for more experience and then come back to VC much later, better equipped. Okay, so now that you've found a way to make yourself valuable to founders, you can actually start to build your track record without yet working at a venture fund. You can just start really small. Some people I know cut $1,000 checks into pre-seed businesses at the very beginning, where any amount is helpful for those founders. And if you don't have any money whatsoever, you could organize an SPV, a special purpose vehicle, or raise money for an angel syndicate. It's a lot of hustle finding deals on one side and then raising money on the other. But this is a way to begin building track record even without your own money. Tons of the most successful investors running angelist syndicates do get picked up by major venture funds. People like Joey Krug at Founders Fund. If you really don't have access to any money, another alternative could be investing your own sweat equity in time. You could volunteer your services like creating marketing copy for an early stage company in exchange for some small equity stake in the business, or potentially just volunteering your time for free in exchange for a reference from the founder. That obviously doesn't scale, but it could be a way to get your foot in the door for an unbelievably hot company that you have conviction in. And getting these sorts of references is another way to show your access and judgment in deals, but through your time rather than your checkbook. Okay, so if you can build a strong track record this way, you're basically operating like a VC already. You might assume that the hardest part is over, but there's still a few extra critical steps to get hired by one of the big league venture funds. If hopefully if you've been throwing yourself headfirst into the startup ecosystem, you've probably already made connections to VCs in the process. But even then, it's still important to step back and figure out more programmatically what VCs are a good fit for you. If you work at an emerging fund versus a late stage growth firm or a classic Sand Hill Series A firm like Kleiner, what you'd be doing day to day can vary dramatically. Typically, you see more of these analytical banker consulting types be a good fit for the late stage funds and more founder types be a good fit for early stage funds. Many awesome growth investors would be terrible at the early stage and vice versa. So it's important to have some self-awareness of your strengths. On top of that, many funds are sector specific, focusing on crypto, gaming, clean tech, or AI. Some funds will try to lead rounds and be very hands-on with a small number of companies, 
which may be a better fit for former operators who can be strong partners to founders, while other funds may spray tons of small follow checks into a huge number of companies, which may favor pure networkers who can source lots of deals. You can think of venture funds a bit like the startup ecosystem. Growth stage funds may be more like late stage companies, which have more valuation risk and lower but possibly safer upside. On that point, the path to becoming rich in venture is through carried interest or a share of the profits when companies successfully exit. So getting a sense for the firm's track record is really important, especially because the vast majority of funds don't actually return capital. It's also important to figure out where venture funds got their money from. Institutional LPs are much more reliable over the long run than high net worth rich people, basically, where a lot of first time managers often raise their money from. And lastly, just like any company, you have to understand your potential career path at the firm and who you're working with. Partners tend to stick around a long time. So it's important to understand if there's actually openings at the senior level. Many funds hire associates with the expectation they just do a two year rotation like Union Square Ventures. That kind of diligence can be even more important in venture capital where turnover is humongous. Up to a third of all junior VCs are fired or leave their jobs every year. Many VCs don't have any openings whatsoever. So a final pro tip I'll leave you with is to subscribe to Term Sheet and check each morning for announcements on new venture funds raised. Those are the VCs who are much more likely to be actually hiring. Okay, so now you've got a list of the top VCs you'd like to interview with. Now comes maybe the hardest part. How do you actually get your foot in the door? Well, you shouldn't just necessarily wait around to see if there's any job openings you can apply to on LinkedIn. Most VCs I know who are hiring don't even post job openings. Here's my advice. Take the top 10 funds you like, pick the partners who you admire the most at each of those funds, study their portfolios, and send them three deals each month that aligns with their thesis. I guarantee you, if you do this well, you're going to get a meeting. But you can get more creative as well if you want to showcase your strength to VCs. Let's say you have a crazy strong network of AI engineers from your time working at Google. Organize a dinner event with them. Invite a luminary speaker you know, like the head of research, and invite a VC or two you know who's interested in AI. You can even just work your network more conventionally to get one-on-ones with your target VCs. Just make sure that you write a compelling note that makes it super clear what that target VC is getting out of the meeting. It could be intel on the latest and greatest in foundation models or a potential introduction to engineering hires or prospective customers for a portfolio company. Just be creative with what you've got and make it ridiculously easy to say yes. Write a forwardable note that doesn't take any editing and is literally a button click for your warm mutual connection to contact your target VCs. That makes it easy for your mutual connections not to have to personally vouch for you necessarily because they can just say they're forwarding a note instead of having to craft their own endorsement of you. But of course, if they're willing to do so, warm endorsements are great. And the best warm connections are not actually other VCs or investors, but founder referrals that those VCs know. If that founder made the VC a lot of money, that is the best possible connection you could possibly have. A final pro tip here is when you actually meet VCs one-on-one, Ask them for recommendations on the two smartest VCs they know. And you can use the tip I mentioned to share notes that are very affordable and actionable to create inherent virality in your meetings. Now, if you ultimately interview at a venture capital fund, it can be very different than interviewing for a company. Often it's more of just like a casual getting to know you process over a much longer time frame. When I interviewed with Kleiner, I was basically just having one-on-ones with each of the four partners who I'd be working with. And when I got the job at Signalfire, it was over multiple meetings and dinners with the founder. There's a ton of content out there on how to ace interviews, so I'm not gonna get into that. But I will say these hiring decisions are even more personal venture funds than companies because these funds are so small. So just being yourself, which is always a good idea, is even more important in venture interview. Now on the actual content of the interview, Make sure you've done your homework and you can speak to portfolio companies you like that that VC has invested in and why, and what other startups generally you're excited about. You of course have to nail your why me pitch on what you can bring that's complementary to the firm, like your own track record or operating experience that's maybe missing in the firm. Those kinds of questions are important because young VCs tend to be learning machines. And at the end of the day, when I interview, I'm looking to understand how unique and compelling is the investment strategy of the person I'm speaking with. The good news is there are more venture funds than ever before. 25 years ago, there were maybe only 40 active venture funds and maybe only 10 of them that really mattered. And most of them were not hiring. But since then, 
the tech industry has exploded. Billions of venture capital has sloshed into startups and there's just too many funds to keep track of. So if you're trying to break in, there's more options than ever. But I have to say, so many people are really interested in joining venture because it sounds like a glamorous job. And I personally find this to be my dream job. I've said this many times, I'm gonna do this until I get fired. But the reality of the job is very different from the expectation. Check out this video to learn more about the biggest surprises I had in being a VC. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.